In this mini lecture, we are going to discuss naming conventions for naming ionic compounds. Now remember, uh, ionic compounds come in two different flavors, binary ionic compounds and so-called polyatomic ionic compounds. So that's going to be the focus of this mini lecture. Let's start off by focusing on so-called binary ionic compounds. So a binary ionic compound is composed of two different elements. Okay, ions of two different elements, where one of the elements is a metal and the other is a nonmetal. So one example is the aluminum oxide, uh, you know, formula provided here, right, and which is the formula for the gemstone sapphire, and another one is the sodium sulfide, right, metal, nonmetal, sodium sulfide, right? chemical formula given here, and the associated, uh, you know, yellow crystalline flakes. Um, that are characteristic of sodium sulfide. Okay, so both of these are examples of binary ionic compounds. In each case, there are only two different types of ions coming together. Okay, so for naming binary ionic compounds uh, boils down to a relatively simple naming convention. Um, but it turns out that we need to be, pay close attention to the characteristics of the metal when we're building up our naming convention for binary ionic compounds. So what we're first going to look at is we're going to look at metals that only form one type of cation. Okay? So the metals we're talking about here are going to be the, you know, that first and second column in the periodic table and then moving over and looking at aluminum. Um, you know, uh, over there, aluminum takes a plus three charge uh, over in the P block elements. And so looking at those first two columns, alkaline, alkaline, earth metals in the periodic table, we know that the first column always takes a plus one charge, second column always takes a plus two charge and the like. And so for these cases where you only have one type of metal cation that's formed, the metal, the method is relatively straightforward. You start off by taking the name of the cation or the name of that metal, just simply write it out. Then you're going to use the so-called base name of the anion or nonmetal. Okay, so the base name is obtained from the name of that nonmetal, and you basically cut off the ending. So fluorine becomes fluor, chlorine becomes chlor, bromine becomes brome, and so on and so forth. Okay, so you you take the base name of that anion, and then you put an ide ending at the end. Okay. So let's look at a couple examples. If we have a chemical formula KCl, right? Our metal, right? Our metal in this case is potassium. So we're going to start off by just writing out potassium, and then we're going to take the base name of chlorine, which is just chlor. Okay. So we're taking that base name, chlor, and then putting an ide prefix or a suffix at the very end. Okay, so potassium chloride becomes the name of the compound. Similarly, CaO becomes calcium oxide. MgBr2 becomes magnesium bromide. Okay, so uh, like I said, a relatively straightforward convention. Name of the metal, then the base name of the anion, and tack on an ide ending at the end. Okay, now this is, remember, only for situations where that metal forms only one type of cation. Okay, so that first and second column, or say aluminum. Okay, things get a little bit more complicated if you're dealing with metals that form more than one type of cation. Okay, so forming more than one type of cation. So, for example, this is something that oftentimes happens with our transition metal elements, those D block elements right there in the center of that periodic table. Okay, so we'll oftentimes run into situations um, like those listed here, just a handful of representative examples, where the metal cations can show up in different charge states. Okay, so when this happens, we are going to uh, essentially use the same sort of model and, and the naming convention, convention. We're going to write out the name of the cation the metal, then we're going to write the base name of the anion and put an ide ending at the end of the day um, at the very end there. But then, right, we are going to introduce a new term here in the center, right, which is uh, Roman numerals in parentheses 
that denotes the charge of that cation. So if I had a cation that was Fe2+, I would write this out as iron 2. If it was Fe3+, I would write it out as iron 3. Okay? And so what you need to be able to do then is look at a chemical formula. So for example here, CrBr3. We know that the Brs, each one of the bromines, each contributes in minus one charge. So we've got three of them. So in order for uh, the chromium bromide here to be a neutral compound, right, the, B, the three Br minuses must be canceled out by a single chromium three plus, okay? And so in this case, we are gonna denote the fact that we have chromium three plus by writing out chromium, but doing a, let me put that in there, there we go, now it's writing, uh, Cr three plus, and then we're gonna denote that three plus charge by a Roman numeral three in parentheses, okay? Similarly, if I have CuO, we know oxygen takes a two minus charge, therefore copper must take a two plus charge. So we know that in this copper oxide um, formula that we have here, uh, it's going to correspond to a copper two oxide. That copper must have a plus two charge. Okay, so as you can see, naming binary ionic compounds, we have the same general format, metal, followed by nonmetal, where you take the base name and put, of the nonmetal and put an eyed ending, right? And then that caveat that if you're dealing with metals that take more than one sort of charge, you have to designate the charge of that metal um, using Roman numerals in parentheses, okay? So that's something, again, that we'll have to worry about when we're dealing with transition metals. All right, now remember, uh, as we've talked about in the intro, uh, there are also a class of poly, uh, so-called polyatomic ions. So polyatomic means many atoms. So we're talking about molecules that have a charge associated with that entire molecule. And what I've done here is basically collected um, a list of common polyatomic ions that you're likely to see you know, over and over again um, in your chemistry studies. And this is certainly not an exhaustive list, but this is the list of uh, polyatomic ions that I'd like you to really be familiar with. Okay, so I'll list a few, right? So we have, you know, acetate, right? Um, that has a chemical formula right over here, C2H3O2 minus, right? And so, you know, carbonate, you know, hydroxide, nitrate, nitrite, chromate, and the list goes on and on, right? So what I want you to do is, uh, you know, basically be able to identify, you given a formula such as this, that that formula does in fact correspond to a call, uh, common polyatomic ion, and this is the name. Okay, so essentially get you get uh, you know become very accustomed to using this table uh, to identify uh, the names of these different ions. Okay, and, and so while you're doing that, I want to draw out uh, you know, a couple trends um, that you might notice, okay? So the first trend, right, um, you know, pops up when we have certain types of compounds where you have an atom and then differing numbers of oxygen atoms, okay? Like this example here, we have a nitrite and a nitrate um, ions, okay? So it turns out that these ions, where you have some element and then different numbers of oxygen atoms, uh, belong to a class of compounds known as oxyanions. So you can kind of think of oxyanion as oxygen-containing anion, okay? And when you have a type, different types of oxyanions that differ in the number of oxygen atoms, we have some simple naming conventions that are followed, and identifying these naming conventions will help you um, not only down the road when you're naming other sorts of compounds such as acids, um, but it'll also you know, essentially cut down on the amount of memorization you have to do when you're trying to um, you know, keep all these different types of uh, polyatomic ions in your mind as you are um, you know, basically working through these problems um, and, and studying chemistry. Okay, so the method that's used then for naming these oxyanions, um, in this case where you have a series of oxyanions with different numbers of oxygen atoms, um, is as follows, right? So basically, you know, looking at the NO2, NO3 example here, right, 
what you we end up doing is changing the suffix to denote the relative number of oxygen atoms. So if you only have two ions in the series, as we do here, all right, then we're going to have one of those ions in the series will have fewer oxygens than the other, and the other one will, of course, have more. Okay? And so the convention is to use the suffix eight right, for the ion that has a greater number of oxygen atoms. And so I've, students like to remember this by thinking, you know, uh, you know, remembering the little mnemonic here, I ate more. Okay? So the eight sub, uh, suffix is associated with the increase or more number of oxygen atoms. Okay, so remember, I ate more. Okay, and and then of course the, um, the other polyatomic ion in the series will have an ite ending, right, which has fewer oxygen atoms. Now, what happens sometimes, as we see here for um, you know this oxy anion series that contains chlorine. Um, what ends up happening at times is that you have more than just two ions in the series. So when this herp happens, we end up using um, prefixes now to denote uh, relative numbers of atoms, oxygen atoms. So hypo is the prefix that means less than. So this first one here, ClO minus, is named hypochlorite. And it was, they were basically saying, hey, you've got chlorite but you, it's w less than chloride, fewer oxygen atoms than chloride, okay? And so uh, chlorate is then, of course, more than, you know, chloride. And then if you have uh, another entry with an increased number of oxygen atoms beyond the chlorate, then we put a prefix uh, per, which means more than. So this guy at the very end literally means more than chlorate, okay? And so that'll help, uh, you know, when you're looking at and trying to commit to memory some of these different um, uh, patterns that are showing up here. So we have like a sulfate and a sul uh, sulfite and a sulfate, right? So there's a, a variety of these examples around. And again, I want you guys to be comfortable with identifying these ionic compounds, these polyatomic ions when you see them in molecular formulas or in whatever context they might show up, okay? And, um, you know, be very comfortable moving back and forth between, um, you know, a given polyatomic ion name and the associated chemical formula. Okay, so let's finish off by just working through a couple examples. Um, so the first example here is NH4Cl, okay? And we were told to come up with the name for this compound, NH4Cl. Okay, so and I think the hard part with this sort of problem is identifying that it is in fact an ionic compound. And the reason being is that this compound is actually comprised of an NH4 plus molecule and a Cl minus. And if we go back to our list of ions, we'll see that um, NH4 shows up right down here. Okay. It's the ammonium ion. Okay, And so we are going to then name this compound by listing out that cation first. Right. So remember our first step was to list out the cation, ammonium, and then we're going to write out the base name of chlorine, which is chlor, but we're going to put an ide ending at the end. So it's ammonium chloride, okay? Similarly here, we have once again an ammonium ion, right, on our next problem. And now in this case, we have another polyatomic ion as our second counter ion. So the polyatomic ion here is nitrate. So we have ammonium Ammonium nitrate, okay? Now notice here that uh, because we are dealing with two different polyatomic ions, I'm not putting an ide ending at the end. I'm simply writing out uh, the cation followed by that anion, okay? And then the last example here has a potassium ion, K plus, associated with 
another oxyanion. In this case, it's MnO4. Okay, so if we come back to our list here, okay, and we scan through, um, we look for MnO4, we'll find it right here, which is permanganate. Okay, so we have MnO4 minus, which is per, uh, permanganate. So we have potassium here, a K, it stands for potassium. And permanganate will be our ion, right? So potassium permanganate. Okay, so that concludes the different types of uh, ionic naming problems that we'll see in this course. So the simplest type is the so-called binary ionic compounds, where you only have two types of atoms, right? Your um, metal and a nonmetal, okay? And we saw how if that metal forms only one type of cation, then all you have to do is simply name the cation first, in this case it's a metal, name the base name of the anion, and then put an ide ending at the end, okay? And of course, if you have more than one type of cation, then the name of the cation is simply followed by a Roman numeral in parentheses that indicates the charge of that metal, okay? So those are basically our two different types of binary ionic compounds, okay? And then we saw how there are so-called polyatomic ions where that charge is associated with an entire molecule, and basically what I want you to be able to do there is use that table, be able to identify different um, uh, ions present in, in chemical formulas and know the difference between the eight and the ite naming conventions, okay? Um, and so if you can basically use eight and ite and identify these common polyatomic ions, um, you know, name them as they pop up, um, then we'll be in good shape for this little lecture series.